well, out there to everybody. Give us a like, uh, subscription, follow all those social media verbs that we all love so much at Think Fiveable. As we uh, do AP Stat responses, I like to just keep a few things in mind that the AP Stat exam, I'm fond of saying this, is that it has a certain degree of expectation for context and communication that they don't always put in the problem stem. Make sure that the language that you're using correctly conveys statistical concepts. Make sure that that language isn't uh, unintentionally, you try to simplify it to make it sound smoother, but you make it wrong. So just be aware of this language uh, as we go. Okay, so this is a very important part. They, may, they will also not always invite you to state your solutions and the answers in context, but you really should. That's very important. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get this started now. So we're going to go through uh, the questions from top to bottom. I'm going to show you kind of how it makes sense of the questions and look at the questions. Um, you should, if you are watching this now on the resources for this, you should be able to see a link to where you can find a copy of this for your very own. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Here's question number one. We have a histogram of sizes of the 20 rooms in a student residence hall. Okay? And so this histogram describes those. And then in part A, it says, write a few sentences describing the distribution of room size in the residence hall. So you should be pretty thankful at this point, it's like, hey, I know, I know how to do this, right? My teacher told me how to do this. This is a, uh, this is a, a description of a distribution based on a graphical display. Q1 is usually one that kind of is there just to kind of get you started off on the right foot. So let's see if we can get started off on the right foot here. Make sure we describe this distribution in context correctly. The acronym I like to use, I know uh, Mr. Argo likes to use this too, I believe. Um, this is uh, what I like to call. Cuss. Your book may use socks, uh, shape, outliers, center, spread. Um, I like to use center unusuals, shape, and spread, or variability. Sock V, as I've, I've also seen because two S's doesn't seem to make sense. But as long as you remember what they both stand for, th that's not really an issue. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's make sure we cuss in context for part A. So we're going to write a few sentences, okay? The center, um, the, and we can actually make some, uh, make some judgments about this because we see that the, uh, we see that the tenth room is in in this. If we really wanted to count, the tenth room is uh, is this room. So this this frequency of three, uh, six, I can count, and one. So that's uh, that's ten rooms. That means that the median is uh, the median room size uh, is going to be uh, basically the average of the lowest uh, thing in the middle as well as the highest one in the uh, the lowest one the highest one in the middle sorry and the lowest one in the next class. Um, you could also use the mean here. So it looks like uh, the uh, the center, the mean we could just say center. Um, the mean, the mean room size, you could try to estimate it, but that takes too much time. So the, the center uh, of the distribution looks like the uh, center of the distribution of room size is approximately uh, two, somewhere in the 200 to somewhere in the 200 to 250 or somewhere is approximately two, I think 250 is approximately a good guess. And we, if you did that, you could say the median. It's approximately 250 uh, square feet, kind of in the range of 200 to 300. Okay. Uh, there appear, appear to be no unusual values. So no unusually small or large room sizes. In other words, there are no outliers. Okay. Then we have, um, let me just continue this down here and then we'll tackle part B. There's plenty of space later. Uh, 
the shape appears to be, there's a kind of a nice little bimodal distribution. Uh, if you say that the, that the bimodal uh, shape exists in a distribution, you should say where the peaks are. So two peaks between 150, 200 square feet, and then 250 to 300 square feet. Okay, so those are uh, various things there. And then let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the spread. Um, the easiest way to to talk about the the spread is to use um, the range usually um, the range of room sizes. And notice how I'm integrating room sizes so I don't have to, so I know that I've got the context going here. The range of room sizes is, um, now I don't know whether it's, uh, whether you have values that are close to the edges of the bar. So um, the safest way is to just to hedge your bets here. Um, if the, if all of the room sizes in the outermost bars are close to their inner boundaries, then the range will only be 300 minus 150 um, is in between. So that's where I'm going to get 150. And range is a meaningful word. Remember that range can sometimes use the, the values range from, but if you use the word range in stat, it needs to be the max minus the min. Uh, and so here, the reason the where I got these is um, outer boundaries, um, depending on on whether max or min, max and min, I'll just say, uh, being close to inner boundaries or outer boundaries of the first and last bars. All right, so that's part A. Part B, summary statistics are given, and then it asks you to draw a box plot uh, and uh, determine whether there are actually potential outliers in the data. When you determine whether there are potential outliers in the data, you need to state your decision criterion clearly. Okay, so for part B, we're gonna use the classic uh, IQR test. You could, um, based on what you see there, you could also, use, uh, if you use a rule like a two standard deviation rule, you can use that here, but you need to make sure you very clearly state what it is that you're doing. Okay. Let's see. So in, in, if you use the two standard deviation rule, I think you also find that there are no potential outliers at the end. Yeah, that looks about right. Yeah. So they, they did it so you could do it either way, just as long as you are consistent and you state very clearly what you're doing. Let me give myself a little more room to work here. So for part B, uh, let's use the 1.5 IQR. The IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1. And we're told what those are in the table. Those numbers are um, 292 and 174. You would have a calculator handy to do that, but then you get 118 for that. So Q1 minus 1.5 IQR is equal to 174 minus 118 times 1.5. Let's get a calculator. Okay, that number is negative three. The min is above negative three, so no low outliers. Q3 plus 1.5 IQR is equal to 292 uh, plus 1.5 times 118 is 469. And the max is less than 469, so no high outliers. So no unusual room sizes. Then use the grid to sketch a box plot. So let's grab that, uh, I, let's grab that one more time. Okay, I'm actually going to go ahead and pull it up separately so I don't keep uh, scrolling to scrolling to those numbers. Okay, in this problem, you're told that the min is 134. They give you a scale. Okay. So as long as you put the, as long as you very clearly like 
state what you're doing. I'm going to use just the top two lines. So the min, I like to just do five lines, especially since there are no um, there are no outliers. And what I'm going to do here as well is um, I'm going to just write the numbers there, just so I'm very clear what it is I'm doing. Q1 is 174. Then the median is 253.5. The Q3 is 292. And then max is 315. Here is a box plot. By the way, our judgment about the median up here, I didn't even look at part B uh, before before answering that question. I just did it based on the graph, and we can see that that uh, that the center, the, the, that uh, data approximately matches up. Okay. All right, so there's a box plot. Part C, what characteristic is uh, not apparent from the box plot, but is apparent from the histogram? It looks like the bimodal nature of the distributions of room sizes is not represented at all on the box plot, but is on the histogram. Usually there's, they're trying to get you to identify one particular characteristic they think is pretty obvious from the graphical display. So that's something that you should, something that you should do. That's question one. Question number two, this is a classic experimental design question. Uh, you can parse it on your own, but you can see that they're describing um, several different concentrations of fungus mixtures. And so it looks like the only thing that the researchers are varying is an amount of fungus. And so they are going to spray, hopefully this, they've controlled the spray, um, the amount that they're spraying and all the other conditions. It's, you're going to, if it doesn't, uh, play into the question. We won't worry about it too much. Yeah. Then um, let's just see what happens. So part A, identify the treatments, experimental units, and response variable of the experiment. Well, the treatments are the things, are, are the different combinations of things that are varied with the, ex, with the, um, the, um, the different factors that they're looking at. Um, explanatory variables or elements, if you will, the only thing that they're really varying is the fungus mixtures. Okay, so here are um, different concentrations of fungus mixtures. So that's really what we're after here. We're after a look at um, which, by, by, can we identify what the treatments are? And the treatments are the, um, the four different concentrations of fungus. Okay, so I'm going to just write out all of the ones that I see. Okay, so that's the only thing that's being varied, and it's being done in four, there are four different, lev uh, four different levels of this um, that they're using. So remember, a combina the combinations of all factors and levels produce treatments. Um, experimental units. The experimental units are the uh, units at which the, the data is being measured. So you go to an experimental unit and you write something down, okay? So the, also the fact that it doesn't tell you what the, like wh how many insects there are, um, this should actually clue you in that the experimental units, and this is, I, my recollection is that this was a fairly missed part, is that the experimental units are actually the 20 containers containing the insects. Um, with uh, an equal an equal number, because what we're doing is we are measuring the number of insects that are still alive in each container. Ugh. We're recording the number of insects still alive in each container, and that uh, that that level of where we're measuring the variable should clue you in that what we've got here is uh, the containers as the experimental units, and the response variable is the no Sorry, number of insects alive after spray in each container. In fact, if you left off this part about in each container, you didn't get full credit. 
you, this needed to be there because if you didn't include in each container, then what would happen is um, you weren't sure whether you're referring to just the total number of insects a lot. Okay, so we're measuring the response variable per experimental unit. And that linkage between experimental unit and response variable should help you um, uh, better understand the structure of an experiment. Part B, does the experiment have a control group? This was actually a pretty fun debate as well, but the only, the only uh, answer that was really accepted was yes. Since um, there is a zero milliliter per liter concentration, it has no fungus. The, um, there was some debate about this, um, but there was the only, uh, the only ex uh, accepted response was, uh, yes, there is a control group uh, because it is a treatment which contains none of the, um, none of the, uh, none of the fungus because they're trying to figure out whether the fungus is useful. So this is a this is a baseline, and in fact, you would argue that this is good experimental control because if you didn't spray the insects, then that would be doing something different. Does that make sense? Hopefully, it does. Okay, so um, that that is necessary for good experimental control that you keep everything else the same. So you should spray every insect if you're spraying some of them. Part C: Describe how the treatments can be randomly assigned to the experimental units so that each treatment has the same number of units, okay? So the experimental units are the, are the, are the containers, as we, we talked about. So what we could do is, um, there, there are lots of things we could do. Um, my favorite is always just to use slips of paper, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to reorient all our wires. Then we're going to uh, make 20 slips of paper, equally sized, um, on five, write zero, on five, write 1.25, on five, write 2.5, and, and this seems like a lot of trouble. Um, for college credit, I would, Take just a little bit of time to describe your process. And on five, write 3.75. Mix these slips of paper well. Draw one slip of paper. Without replacement. By the way, without replacements implied unless you say it. Per container, spraying that container with the specified concentration of fungus in milliliters per liter. All right, you need to make sure that what, however you answer this question, that your response will will uh, correctly give an equal number of. Uh, treatments per uh, number of units per treatment with an equal probability that the treatments are assigned as, uh, as, as you would expect. For example, if you, roll a, if you roll a die and you just go through each container and you assign what you get to, like, to treatment, so like, let's say that you have roll a six-sided die or, and you, you looked at the numbers one through four and you just re-rolled any fives and sixes, or if you had a four-sided die, which does exist, um, if you had, if you rolled a die and then you just assigned treatments until those treatments were full, um, you would actually find that there is not an equal probability of assigning every, um, every possible tank. So like if you, all those tanks that are number 20, unless you randomly assigned the numbers one to 20 to each tank, then you'd be okay. But if you just labeled them in a line, like um, in the lab one to 20, and then rolled a die and then just kept assigning treatments until they were full, the later treatments would have disproportionate probabilities of going to different places. It would be a really weird, um, be a really weird thing to do, okay? So you wanna make sure that you um, assign, uh, use, a, use a straightforward method. The, slip of the slips of paper method is always a very straightforward method.
let's move along. Question number three. A medical researcher surveyed a large group of men and women, and then they give you relative frequencies slash proportions, right? So the proportion of people in each category, and that's a, that is a category, that is a dual distribution, right? So 40, you can see that 47% or 0.47 is the proportion of men in the sample, um, but they are classified that those 0.47 are then also classified in addition by their response. So 5.64% of the respondents in this group uh, were men who responded never. Okay, so that's an important uh, piece of the puzzle that you need to know. Okay, so part A. One person from those surveys will be selected at random. What is the probability that the person selected will be someone whose response is never and who is a woman? Well, we select one person from the whole group. So none of these are conditional, right? So let, at this at, at this point, this well, this one's not conditional. We'll, we'll talk about the rest later, okay? So the probability that someone whose response is never and who is a woman, you just read that directly from the table. The probability of a woman and um, never is directly readable. It's 0 0.636, 0 0.0636, sorry. Part B, or part two. What is the probability that the person selected will be who, someone whose response is never or who is a woman? There's a lot of ways that you can approach this. Um, so what you can do, for example, is you can just add up the appropriate, uh, the appropriate four probabilities in the table. Okay, so the ones that apply to part two, I'm going to temporarily highlight them, are this one, this one, this one, and this one. Because the woman doesn't matter what the response is, but it could also respond never. If you add up all four of these different probabilities, and notice, yes, there is a rule for this kind of thing, but I'm skirting around the rule simply by showing you the, basically, here's the sum of all the possible outcomes that uh, that lead to the that lead to the uh, response. Um, so I can just read these from the table as well. A probability uh, woman or never is 0 0.0564 plus 0 0.0636 plus 0.1384 plus 0 0.3280. And that total is 0.5864. Four. Five, eight, six, four. Make sure that's clear. That's not clear. Um, you could also do the following. Um, this is, of course, P of woman plus P of never minus P of woman and never. Okay. These two things are readable from the table, but they're not readable from the places where I put them. The probability of woman is here. The probability of never in the table is here. And so you need to read them from the, to the, uh, the marginal distributions, the totals in the, in the sides. So this is 0 0.53 plus 0 0.12. Then you found this probability in part A as 0 0.0636. And if you did that, you should also get... 0.5864, which you do. Okay. So this is an alternative for part two. You could use the rule. Part three, uh, what is the probability the person selected will be someone whose response is never given that the person is a woman? And now here is where the here's where the fun begins. Okay. So let's let me just go down here and just start writing here. So part A, part A, part three. Um, the probability, the, the, uh, the pro probability of never given woman is equal to the probability of woman and never. And then the line tells you what goes in the denominator. In this case, the probability of woman. Another way to think about this is that we are figuring out how many nevers there are only out of the women. And so that's either way you slice it, that's 0 0.63, oh, 0, 0636 uh, divided by 0. 0.5300. Okay, that is pretty important. 
Okay, because that will come into play very shortly. This number is exactly 0.12. For part B, are the events of a person uh, whose response is never and being a woman independent? Okay. Um, what that means is that knowing that uh, someone is a woman doesn't affect the probability that they responded never. Okay. So there are lots of ways that this is uh, stated. So for part B, um, independent if probability of never is equal to the probability of never given woman, technically also equal to the probability of never given not woman. I'm going to write that as woman C for complement. You can, you, some people use um, a line over it to indicate the complement of the event. Okay. The probability of never is directly readable from the table. The probability of never given woman, you already figured out in part A. You, this is as much as you needed to show uh, for credit, but I'm also gonna show you this part. So the probability that you responded never given you were not a woman, okay? And so, uh, or given, given not woman. And so that probability is 0.0564, that's for the men, over 0.47. Okay, and I want to know if, if, if one of those things are equal. Well, I already said that, so let's see. Uh, 0 0.0564 over 0.47, which equals 0.12. Um, since the probability of never is unaffected by knowing if the respondent is a woman or, or a man, Well, either referring to identifications. Um, uh, these events are independent. Um, for the people surveyed. I don't, I'm pretty sure you don't need to say that. And this is pretty strong evidence that those events are are independent in the population as well because you this is a random a random sample. It doesn't say if it's a random sample, but within people that are like this group, those things appear to be independent. All right, part C. Assume that in a large population, the probability a person will always take medicine as prescribed is 0.54. If five people are selected at random from the population, what is the probability that at least four of the people selected will always take medicine as prescribed. Okay. So let's let's grab a look at that. Okay. It doesn't look like um, this really depends on the other two parts. And I just reading it over one more time to be sure that I believe that. I do, but I'm just looking at it one more time. A large population probably will always take medicine as prescribed is 0.54. Okay. And I guess the relationship is, um, is just to the context. It's not actually related to these numbers. Okay. So if the probability that a person will always take medis medicine as prescribed is 0.54, what is the probability that at least four of the people selected will always take medicine as prescribed? So um, for a large population, okay, if we select five people at random from the population, um, for five people from a large population, we can assume they're taking medicine as prescribed or not, um, are independent of each other. And this is the different sense of independent, by the way. 
for a small population, uh, you would the fifty four percent would um, as you as you pulled more and more people out, the probability that the next person would would not prescribe be take their medicine as prescribed would vary greatly from point five four. Let's say that you only had a um, uh, hundred or maybe even fifty fifty people in the sample, right? And so. Uh, 27 out of 50, as you start pulling people out from this, the probability the left over from that would um, would start to vary quite a bit from 0.27. 50 is about the, the bare minimum um, that you would want to use for that. Okay. So 5 million people in they're independent of each other. Therefore, the number of people in the sample who take as prescribed is binomially distributed. Okay, now I'm gonna take a moment to define X as my random variable here. Okay. So the probability that X is bigger than or equal to four is equal to the probability that X equals four plus the probability that X equals five. Now, you can demonstrate your knowledge of this by la very carefully labeling um, a, a binomial uh, CDF command. Okay, so that's one thing you could do. Uh, with the advent of menus, it becomes harder and harder to kind of connect the two things. Um, if you wanted to write the formulas, And I'm also going to write the parameters for the binomial distribution n equals 5 and p equals 0.54. Um, you could write the formulas out. Um, I don't recommend that you do this unless you know um, exactly what you're doing. Okay. So out of the five, the probability that you would have four um, comply. And so when they comply, there are four compliances and one non-compliance. And then the probability that all five comply. And you, this is that's a, this has a hidden 0.46 to the zero if you really want to include it. Um, let's write it in. I'll write it in a very light color. Okay. Um, or I'm going to tell you what the number is. You tap on your calculator. I work this, the solution here gives. Let's just go to four decimal places. This is about 0.2415. Or what you could do is express this. Um, this is this is enough um, to, to show you know the idea. Um, let's do um, this is the easiest way to do it on your calculator. Um, and this is one minus binom CDF, uh, where you have an n of 5, p of 0.54, and up to three successes. And so CDF is required so that you know, then the, and the reader knows that you know that um, you're doing the, the, the um, cumulative probability distribution function. Okay, And here, this is n, and this is p. Okay. That number is. Uh, one minus again to point two four one five. That's question three. All right, question four. So here we go with question four. Tumbleweed is found in the Western United States, and uh, we are concerned in this case, it looks like, that these plants are becoming more resistant to an herbicide. And so you, there are, they've described for you two different samples and gave you two percentages. And what they want to know is if the data provide convincing statistical evidence at a significance level that there has been an increase in the proportion. Okay. Uh, this screams hypothesis test. And in particular, because you're given two samples and the response variable measured, is percentage of resistance, then this 
this just screams a two proportion Z test. Okay. That's it's just, it's just classic. Okay. So, um, if you've seen, uh, some of my streams on this before, you know, that my preferred way of knowing whether I have done everything for a significance test is called phantoms. Okay. P is the parameter. Okay. So I'm going to define some parameters. Uh, P2014 is the true proportion of uh, glyphosate resistant cochia in 2014. The sample gives me some evidence of what that proportion is. And I want to know, based on these two different samples that are independent, how likely is it that, uh, the, prop that the proportion in 2017 is higher? So 2017, we have the true proportion of glyphosate resistant cochia in 2017. Okay. My null hypothesis, so now we're on to H. My null hypothesis is that P2017 is equal to P of 2014. My alternative hypothesis, the one I want to see if I have evidence for, is that P of 2017 is greater than P of 2014. And so what we're, what we're after here is, um, again, a two-proportion z-test. I like to take these at the same time, assumption and the name of the test. Okay. So this is a two-proportion uh, well, let's 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 let me write this out. The two uh, sample z test for uh, difference in population proportions. Okay, so it's two sample z test for difference population proportions. That's my name, but I haven't checked the conditions. Uh, we have two separate. Uh, two separate populations, uh, proportions here. So what we need to do is we need to, uh, we need to check whether these conditions are, are, are met. Okay. So I'm going to do this in the, in the textbook way. Okay. If we believe that the, that the, uh, null hypothesis is true, then what, what the true population proportion is, uh, is a combination of the of the two estimates at each time. So let's go back and let's take a look specifically at the estimates that were given. Okay, this problem looks kind of tame on the surface, but they did one weird thing to you, and that is they didn't give you the number, they gave you a percentage. Okay, so in 2014, P hat, okay, so, well, I'll, I'll just do P hat of 2014. Uh, is equal to um, was is approximately equal to. You should you should treat any percentage that's reported as an approximation as 0.197. Okay, and so since 0.197 times the number of plants sampled, six which is 61. Okay, we'll check. We'll do, do deal with this in a second. That is uh, about 12. So I am assume I'm going to work off the assumption that P of 2014 is equal to 12 out of 61. Okay. Similarly, in 2017, I'm going to work off the assumption that this percentage given is a rounded percentage. That's 38.5%. 0.385 times the 52 randomly selected plants in this case. 20.02. And so I am going to say that P hat of 2017 is 20 out of 52. And that's important because if the null hypothesis is true, then these two things are just noise, they're random variation. So my pooled estimate for what that proportion should be is P hat C. And that is a commonly used uh, notation that says we believe this that we're going to hypothesize what this what this proportion would be it's based on our estimates combined and i'm not just going to combine them as fractions 
I'm going to say that the 12 out of the 61 and the 20 out of the 52 are really all successes out of a larger uh, pool of successes, which is 28. This, by the way, this number, by the way, is about 0.2832, if it matters to you. Okay. We're going to find that we really don't need to use that exact number, but I'm just going to write it down just in case that is a meaningful number for you. Now I'm going to check the conditions using p hat c, okay? because we're going to say that the combination of these two normal distributions, um, if, we, if we believe that both distributions are, are normal distributions, then we should be able to combine them into another underlying normal distribution for this, for this sampling distribution. Okay, so. Um, let's check that we believe that both of these should be normal and that we feel like uh, we have a good understanding of what these uh, change to be. So let's check conditions. Okay, I'm going to write approximately normal because the random, uh, no, I'm sorry, approximately normal, that is the, um, that's the number of successes. P hat C times the combined N C is uh, 32, and 113 times 113. And so the number of successes is 32. The criterion R that my textbook uses is greater than or equal to 10. Uh, yours might use five, but as long as it's greater than or equal to 10, that's fine. And the number of failures should be at least uh, 10 as well. So that leaves 81 failures. Right. So we believe that that those those counts are all greater than ten. You can check um, using the uh, you can check use it, it is okay to check by the way just using the uh, the numbers you get up here. So for example, the fact that this number is tw the expected count is uh, uh, you can you can also check it against the. Um, you can check it against each of the populations. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, let me back up here. Some, like if there was someone out here watching, they could have said something. Um, so this pooled proportion, let's do, uh, we should really check it against 2014. And so this is um, 32 out of 113 times the number that were estimated in, uh, the number that you measured in 1661. And that's 17.2, 17.3, which is greater than or equal to 10. Um, PC times um, 1 minus PC times N of 2014. That is 32 out of 113 times uh, 1 minus 32 out of 113. So that's our 81, 113. OK, and that is times 61 as well. Uh, that number should add up to, those numbers should add up to 61 anyway. And so that's about 47, 43.7. And that number is bigger than or equal to 10. Um, PC times N2017. It is okay to check these conditions using just the estimated estimated P hat. Some books do do it that way. Um, this is the this is the way that you uh, technically should do it. So 32 out of 113 times 52, that expectation is 14.7, which is bigger than or equal to 10. This expectation then will be 52 minus 14.7. That is about 37.3. Okay. Those are all bigger than 10. So we are good to go. We believe that um, these, these distributions have enough successes and failures that we can consider them to be um, approximately normal. Um, let's talk about the random condition, uh, unbiased estimator, the center slash random condition. Both samples are stated as random samples. Okay, and then the independent, um, the spread slash independent condition. Um, 
61 and 52 um, should be less than 10% of a large population of plants. The hard part's over. The calculator will do the rest for us. We could um, do the, because we've stated the test by name, we don't really need to um, go into the formulas. Uh, if you are curious, then you can, um, what you can do is set up the z-test statistic. But if you do both, uh, you set up the z-statistic uh, Z uh, statistic wrong and you name it, then they'll they'll assume that you don't know how to do it. So we've already named it. We've already done everything that we need to do there. So we've got um, fan, P-H-A-N. So next is T. We need to write down the value of the test statistic, and we need to obtain the p-value. OK, so the test statistic in this case is going to say by technology. The test statistic here is Z. And I'm going to use, the reason I worked out all of these numbers is that I have to, um, when I'm doing the two prop Z test on, on my handy dandy TI-84, I have to know exactly how many successes and failures there were. Okay. Um, you can use the Z statistic if you use the formula. So that's, that's one advantage of using the, using the numbers given and not using the, using these, uh, going back and trying to find the exact, um, values. So X1, so we're going to let, um, we're going to let 2017 be the, be the first population because I sit, my null hypothesis is that, um, is that 2017 has a larger true proportion. Okay. And so my Z test statistic, um, for, um, Uh, let's see. The, my z-test statistic is 2.210, and my p-value is 0 0.0136. Going to make a make a decision. State conclusion and context. So making a decision here, since p-value equals 0 0.0136 is less than alpha, which is 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. We have sufficient evidence to conclude the, the proportion of glyphosate resistant cochia increased from 2014 to 2017. Okay. Let's see if there's anything else that I need to. Um... All right. Question five. A company that manufactures smartphones developed a new battery with a longer lifespan than that of a traditional battery, and now we have ourselves a normal distribution question. This is a this is an exciting question, okay? And it's uh, very it's it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. It's just do you make sure that you have uh, lifespan 
fixed in your mind that the lifespan is how long it will last. Okay. So let's um, describe what we've got here. So we have our distribution of batteries. I'm going to go ahead and just start part A here. Um, the distribution of batteries is approximately normal with mean 30 months and standard deviation eight months. Okay, I'm going to, in the interest of time, ignore the weird thing that my computer just did there. Okay, so that's our standard. Um, um, depiction of a normal curve with notation and with a mean and three standard deviations indicated as rulers uh, on the way as, as sort of like a ruler on the on, on the axis. That's the bare minimum. In how many months from the date of purchase is it expected that 25% of the batteries will no longer work? Okay, so what that means is that I want to know what the um, what the 20 basically the 25th percentile, as it were, of the batteries lifespan is okay and um basically i want to know um kind of just eyeballing this i know that the middle the middle is 68 percent right 68 95 99.7 so if there's 68 percent already that leaves 16 percent to the that would leave 16 percent to the left of 22 so i'm gonna i know that my area of 0.25 is going to be slightly um slightly bigger than the pro this is the probability that the lifespan is less than or um, equal to um, or the, this error the, is less than or equal to some value. <laughs> the area is 0.25. Because I know what the area is, but I don't know what to write here. Because I don't know what to write there. This is really an in-norm question. So uh, what we're expected to do here is um, okay. we, we need to just figure out some way that's, that's justifiable. This tells me to use um, the 25th percentile can be found by using end norm. And I'm just going to use a labeled command because I've already got a labeled diagram. So I'm just going to use a labeled command. The left tail area is 0.25, the mean is 30, and the standard deviation is 8. Okay, And that number is, and this is going to give me the, because I gave it a mean and a standard deviation, it's actually going to give me the 25th percentile. And that's uh, 24.6 months. Right. And so we need to, uh, we, we did all this based just on a normal distribution. All right. Now, part B, suppose one customer who purchases the warranties. Let's review the warranty. There's a two year warranty. Oh, interesting. On the new battery. Hmm. Okay. So that's a price of 50. The company, the warranty guarantees that the smartphone will be replaced at no cost to the consumer if the battery no longer works within 24 months from the date of purchase. Okay. Now, what's the probability? that the customer selected will require a replacement within 24 months from the, from the date of purchase. Okay. Part B, that's a, that's a slightly different reasoning here. It's a very, it's the same distribution. But now we're told This is the warranty timeline, basically, right? And so this is N38. And so this is the probability that the lifespan is less than or equal to 24. Well, I guess it's less than. So within 24 months? Uh, so the semantics doesn't really matter. Okay. So the probability the lifespan is within 24 months. And for the record, um, College Board said it was less than or equal to. Okay. And so this is equal to this area. And this area is equal to normal CDF. Uh, uh, negative infinity, which I'm going to write as negative 1 E99. That's lower um, 24 upper with a mean of 
30 and a standard deviation of 8. I always find it interesting when the normal CDF problem occurs this late in the test. Okay, and this probability is about 0.2266. There are lots of ways that you can express this. If you found the z-score of 24, then you could look it up in the table and report whatever probability uh, was, was there in the table. The z-score happens to be negative 0.75. Um, it's the, it is um, 30 minus 3 fourths of a standard deviation. So whatever the z-score for negative, the, the z-score of negative 0.75, whatever the value is in the table, you could also look it up as well. It should be, it should be that, um, it, it should be this number. Finally, part C, the expected value. Oh, here's a, here's a concept that we haven't thought about in a while. Um, expected value for the, of the gain of the company for each warranty purchased. Okay. So See, the expected gain, I'm going to just use English to describe this. The expected gain equals the, um, the monetary gain, the net gain um, for warranty. If um, net gain for warranty times the probability that um, the warranty is not triggered. plus the net loss, and that loss will be negative for replacement. And these are all net. I didn't do a good job of spacing this out. Times the probability of uh, warranty triggered. Okay. Well, what's the probability that the warranty, what's the probability that the warranty trigger, triggers? Well, you found that in part you found that in part uh, B, right? The probability that the warranty triggers is 0.2266. So the, prob the probability that the warranty does not trigger, in other words, that the lifespan is greater than 24 months, is 1 minus 0.2266. Now, if uh, the, the warranty costs $50, right? So they gain $50 if you don't trigger the warranty. But they lose how much? Well, they lose... Um, a net loss of $150 for each customer. I guess that means that the, the phone costs them 200, I guess. And so the net loss for replacement is negative 150 times 0.2266. And that's the answer because the expected value of, a, of, of something is, the, is for each possible outcome for that thing, you multiply it by the probability of that outcome and you add them all together. So that's what we've got here. Okay, so this is 50 times uh, 1 minus 0.2266 minus 150 times 0.2266. So the expected gain, um, and let's interpret this in, in context. And so then, so the expected gain, and this is per warranty because it's, this is the net gain for that warranty. So that's why it's, that's why the numbers are what they are. So the company expects to gain $4.68 per warranty it sells. That's why they sell warranties. And that's why the, the warranty uh, the warranty period sometimes can, can be very well, you, you can do a little bit of a shaping of the warranty period to match the conditions that you have. Okay, that's question five. And then we get to our friend, the investigative task. This one takes a little bit longer. So question six, Emma's moving to a large city and she investigates a sample, a random sample of rental prices for 51 bedroom apartments. Describe the population for which it is appropriate for Emma to generalize the results from her sample. And you might recall that uh, what we're talking about here are uh, basically what what does this sample representative of? And so she took a random sample of things on a website. So the population for which it's appropriate for Emma to generalize the results from her sample would be um, the population of um, rental prices I'm going to describe this as carefully as possible. One bedroom apartments for 
listed on this website. Okay. That's it. At the and yeah, it should probably be at the at the time of the sample. That is the population that this is representative of. This is you'll notice that this is a description of the sampling frame. Okay. She may have intended to get information about all one bedroom apartments, but she can only really generalize her results to the, the kinds that are listed on this website. Okay, so for part B, Emma wants to estimate the typical rental price of a one bedroom apartment in the city based on the distribution shown. What's the disadvantage of using the mean rather than the median? Okay. Um, the mean is not resistant to outliers and skew, right? So for part B, um, the distribution of rental prices shows a strong right skew. The mean will um, be influenced in an upward direction by the uh, higher value or the higher rent apartments okay the the mean um would overestimate so we need to actually atq was like about to say we need to answer the question uh, a disadvantage of using the mean rather than a median as an estimate of the typical rental price okay um the mean will overestimate the rental prices typically experienced by renters. Okay. And the and the median would would um, be a, a better estimate in this case. All right. So that's part B. Part C. Um, Emma has a sample median. Um, how could someone develop a theoretical sampling distribution of the sample median for samples of size 50? Well, this is asking you what the definition of a sampling distribution is. And in order to, to develop the theoretical sampling distribution, you have to actually find um, the sample median for every possible sample. of size 50 from this website. Okay. Um, this is all like all to the all all of them together are form the sampling distribution form the sampling distribution of the sample median. Okay, ain't no one got time for that. So this ends the typical part. Um, this, we, what we need to talk about is the non-typical part. We need to talk about, we need to talk about the um, distribution that you would actually experience. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, Sorry, I don't know what I just said there. Uh, we need to talk about the part that's new here, the, the the thing you would actually experience here, and try to do something, uh, try to do something with that one sample that you have. Uh, that sam that technique is called bootstrapping. Okay, and so this is a part that you almost certainly have not done in your class, unless you've had a lot of time, and you probably didn't have any time given the current uh, state of things. So this is probably a new thing to you. So this is the part of the question six where you're along for the ride. Again, I do want to stress that this part uh, is not 
this part because it's not tested, uh, it's, it's not in the course material, and they've explicitly said that there's no investigative task. Um, you would be either given a lot more scaffolding, a lot more information about this kind of problem, or you would not have to solve a kind of problem like this. But I do want to take you through it since we're here. We're already 11 minutes over, and that would be fine. Okay, so here we go. Here is what she found. And when she runs the, ran the bootstrap process, all she did is just took a sample within the sample and recorded the median of that sample. And she did that 15,000 times. Thank you, computers. Okay, so this is what she found. In this frequency table, find the value of the fifth percentile. Okay, fun fact. The CED now defines percentile as a value where you have um, that percent of the data that is less than or equal to that observation. Okay, so the fifth percentile, uh, I want to know what 5% of the total number of samples she took is. And that is... 750. And similarly, the 95th percentile that is 14,250. Okay, I want to know where these numbers occur in the distribution. Okay, so we're going to start where you have to start adding frequencies until we get to 750. So let's get at our calculator. So one we're pretty, I'm pretty sure that 1 plus 13 plus 18 plus 56 isn't going to do it. In fact, I'm going to kind of have to go down to 136. So I'm going to start by adding up all of these frequencies. All of these frequencies add up to 408, and then you get a 1,899 sample medians of 2,500. So the value of the fifth percentile uh, then is going to be 2,500 since 750 observations are less than or equal to 2,500. And I'm going to leave that word there so they know like that 750 observations isn't um, a random number. And the value of the 95th percentile then, um, we're going to go the opposite way, OK? Uh, we're going to start on this end of the, ta uh, of the table, OK? So then this says that uh, we're going to kind of do that process in reverse. I'm going to see when I get to 750. And it looks like. This 700 is pretty much going to, like, just like this 1899 seals the deal here, this 700 is going to seal the deal here. So if I do 3 plus 2 plus 6 plus 1 plus 12 plus 65 plus 6 plus 93 plus 700, that number is 88, and then 15,000 minus that is 14,112. Okay, so that means that 14,250 observations, so this these all total up to 888. And so all the numbers above it total up to 14,112. So the cumulative frequency. Is 14,112 to this point. So that means that that 14,250th observation has to be found in here. So 2950 is the um, 95th percentile since um, 14,250 observations are less than or equal to, and I'm going to just add a dollar sign on here, 2,950, just to have some modicum of context there. Um, part E, find the percentage of bootstrap medians in the table that are equal to or between the values found in part D. OK, so here we go. Um, that are equal to or between the values. So what I want to do now is I want to take these things that I've marked with black lines here and just add them up. Okay, so I'm I'm going to have to add again. 1 plus 13 plus 18 plus 56 plus 4 plus 56 plus 3 plus 136. Okay, these, are, these 408 lie outside the interval. Same thing with the, um, let me make very clear what I'm doing here. These lie outside. Just like these lie outside. And so this is 93 plus 6 plus 65 plus 12 plus 1 plus 6 plus 2 plus 3. That is 188 that lie outside the uh, outside the, the range. So the percentage of bootstrap medians that are equal to or between the values is equal to 15,000 minus 408 minus 188 out of 15,000.
that is about 96 point. And it says percentage, so I'm going to report it as a percentage. 96.03%. Use your values from parts D and E to construct and interpret a confidence interval for the median rental price. Oh, that's different. Okay. But here we go. We see that if we take the interval from 2,500 to 2,950, um, these values between a value between 2,500 and 2,950 inclusive showed up 96.03% um, of the time. Therefore, a 96% confidence interval for the median rental price is 2,500 to 2,950. We are 96%. Um, uh, let's find the median rental price of um, apartments on this website, one bedroom apartments. Is that interval, we are 96% confident. The true median rental price of all one bedroom apartments on this website is um, in the is in the interval 2500 and all that's happening here is the can you connect the idea of a confidence interval with a plausible estimate and that's really all that's going on here okay we went quite a bit over but hopefully there are some good nuggets for you to take away here. Uh, again, please remember that what we what we want to look for in any um, we want to look for in any uh, response is, is the practice correct? Um, and is is that something a statistician would actually is, would it actually would they actually do that? Um, Make sure that you are clear on context, that you're clear on the difference between a model, a, a, what, and especially what happens in a sample, and what happens in reality. Well, thank you guys for coming uh, to this particular presentation today.